disciples preaching for Jesus' name had become known. And some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and for this reason the powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah, and others said, it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I have beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison, on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. And when he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. And when his daughter Herodias came and danced, she was pleased. And Herod and his guests and the king said to the girl, Ask for whatever you wish and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask of me, I will give you even half my kingdom. So she went out and she said to her mother, What should I ask for? And she replied, The head of John the Baptist. And immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was great, deeply grave, and yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. And immediately the king sent a soldier of guard with orders to bring John's head. And he went and he beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And then the girl gave it to her mother. And when his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. And at the same time, 
it's being used for all of these people over in another country to infiltrate our election system. And it's almost like this is a world in which two different entities are coming at me, and I don't know if, you know, the Russians are peeking at what I've got to say, I doubt it very much. They want to get into the political system. So I've got one unit, I've got my computer, and I've got good going on, and I've got a system that can be infiltrated because somebody wants to destroy our democratic system. One world, two entities. In the reading of the Gospel this morning, Mark, who pulls no punches, is the only one who describes the death of John the Baptist. And he doesn't start like Matthew or Luke with an infancy story. There are no camels, there are no wise men, there are no shepherds, nothing like that. He gets right into it. Jesus walks in, the kingdom of God is in your midst. Repent. Wow. And then suddenly in chapter 6, Mark seems to need to describe this horrendous story about power. Now you've got two different worlds, just like the internet. You've got Jesus walking in. The kingdom of God is at hand. And all of a sudden, chapter 6, Mark gets us with this whole story. Now, let's not mince words here of what's going on. Herod absconds with his brother's wife. Step number one. Why? For political reasons. And she's not adverse to it at all because she knows Herod has a lot more power than his current, her current husband. And she just walks away. And off they go to Palestine. And they have this child, Herodias' daughter. And there's a birthday party going on. Do you throw your own birthday party? Usually somebody else does it, but you see, among the wealthy and the arrogant, you want to be sure that you're going to celebrate, and your others are going to come and they're going to celebrate whether they want to or not. You've got to come to my party. Now, notice what is happening. Herodias has been wanting to get rid of John the Baptist for years because he keeps hollering about the illegality of she marrying her brother's brother, her, her husband's brother, and now she's out to get him, but she doesn't know how. So in the midst of this gala party, what does she do? She pushes out her teenage daughter to dance for Gary. Now, Mark is kind of soft on this, okay? And when the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Harry. Let's get real. He lusted after her. That's the reality. He wasn't pleased. Nice job. <laughs> How about a coffee? How about some lemonade? No. no. <laughs> and here's the kicker. Her mother is standing beside pimping her daughter to her husband. Now how low do you want to go on this whole level? And she goes back and says, Mom, what should I ask for? And she's got it right where she wanted. I want the head of John the Baptist on the platter. And she goes back, tells Herod, this is what I want. Now, here's the problem. Herod likes John the Baptist. He really does. He's interested in his philosophy and what, what religion is all about. He likes to keep him almost like in a cage in prison. Talk to him now and then. Talk to me about what your belief is. And so he struck he doesn't want to do it. But here's the problem. If he doesn't do it, all those wonderful invited guests see him acquiescing after he made a promise to this young, nubile teenager who's been dancing for him. So what is he going to do? The exact thing that he doesn't really want to do. And there you go. So you start off with Mark's Gospel, the kingdom of God is at hand, six chapters, suddenly you have this horrendous story about what power and money and the influence of it all in Herod's life, all the people he knows, his illicit wife, his dancing daughter, the death of John the Baptist, and you say, from whence did this all come? Because Mark wants us to see that there are two different entities going on in the world.
world in which he writes. The entity of my computer, the goodness of what it can do for my wife, over against 12 Martians coming in to infiltrate and want to destroy. One world, two identities. Same thing with Mark's gospel. Kingdom of God is at hand, and Jesus comes out and cures people. Now, all of a sudden, we have this story of Herod, his wife, evil woman, pushing out her daughter. Two different identities standing out in the world. And so our job as baptized Christians is simply to say to ourselves, what are the entities in our life that are in competition with each other? They live in the same place, breathe the same air, doesn't have to be the computer, it could be anything else that goes on in the world. And whose side are you on? Given the fact that you say, I believe in Jesus, I believe he is the Son of God. Okay, as is often said, don't tell me what you believe, tell me what you do about it. And that is the overriding problem of looking at a text like this and say, isn't that terrible? What are the things in the world that we are willing to say, isn't that terrible, that we might be actually supporting? Indirectly even, we don't even realize it. Calling ourselves Christian is not enough just to say the words. It is to enter the very scrutiny of what's going on all around us at any given time and say, what is it, what is it that is just so terrible that it parallels what happens to John the Baptist in this story this morning? What is it? What am I willing to do about it? And then and only then do we realize that saying I'm a Christian is not all that easy to do if you take it seriously. But it's tough sledding. So, here you've got a story, it's a terrible story, the end of John the Baptist, and all of a sudden it opens up to the mission of Jesus in the world. But Jesus doesn't wind up any better than John the Baptist, does he? To we who live today comes the terrible job of searching our own conscience and saying, what have I contributed simply because I didn't think hard enough or long enough about it? And now that I understand it, what am I going to do? You all know the story of Amazing Grace, the ship captain who was transporting slaves from Africa to America, and all of a sudden he realized the terrible sin. So he writes the words, Amazing Grace, I once was lost, but now I'm found. And from that moment on, he worked tirelessly for the end of his life to end slavery. There are moments of time in some people's lives that are like a bolt of lightning, and suddenly they realize, what I thought I knew, I never knew. What I supported, I should never have supported. But we can't wait around, waiting for those thoughts to come like lightning bolts. It takes some time. And that is kind of the kicker, isn't it? Because you have to say to yourself, okay, um, we did confession and forgiveness. We got that part over with now. Now we can get to the nice part that feels good. We like to hear the gospel. We like to hear that God is loving. We love to see him with lambs in his arms, holding little children. It's a piety, you see, that's also easy to adopt and make us forget what we're really called to do. To do justice. To love mercy. To walk humbly with God. As you heard the words of the song, you are loved. that is your fiber as to who you are, then you might want to continue reading the Gospel of John and find out what that really means chapter after chapter after chapter.